we, we have Ed for another 10 minutes, so maybe invite um, any comments and questions for Ed uh, first. Um, volunteers? Hello, I haven't quite phrased the question just yet, but currently in the UK and for a little while, we have had this measure of uh, GDP, uh, whether per capita or in general, which is very different. Uh, we have measured formal economy. These days, there's a lot of informal economy, uh, not only in the UK, but you know, in the world. Uh, furthermore, we also have got zero-hour contracts. So what is the right kind of measurement that we need to look at? Is it well-being? Is it uh, how many jobs, uh, job satisfaction? Um, and I, I would like that answer, uh, if, if possible, by you, and perhaps or a comment from the panel. Thank you. I'm probably the worst person on the panel to give a coherent answer to that question um, because uh, I'm not a specialist in the measurement of, uh, of GDP. I suppose one thing I would say, and I've had this conversation with, 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 with Diane recently, I personally think there's quite a lot of power in the personal well-being measures that is yet to be tapped. Um, and I think uh, the sort of standardization around a, a, well, where are you there you are. <laughs> sorry uh, you 're there you 've obviously moved um, uh, uh, I think a, a, a lot of the things you were talking about about, about uh, creating a, a theory I think could fruitfully pursue that uh, angle would be my own personal perspective on that, um, but I think you probably are going to give a much more coherent answer than me so it 's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I, I made this sort of uh, remark about how absurd it was that we don't know how much work, time, and value people put into informal work in the home, caring for the children and cooking the meals. But we do measure prostitution because there's a market for it. And, and that does seem absurd to me. But on the other hand, there is actually a huge illegal economy that economists ignore because you can't download the statistics from the internet and do regressions on it. And it's something that we might like to see policy action about. Um, but I think this is just another um, angle on the dilemma that we've been skating around in terms of the production of numbers, which is, do you have one that's powerful and does have the symbolic power that Mary was talking about? Or do you have several, and if you have more than one, do you go for Sam's five, or do you go for that 450, because people can take action on, on all of those? And um, that's quite a long way of saying I don't actually know the answer to a question. <coughs> uh, uh, okay, this is not, I suppose it's not really a question of mine. This is a question implied by uh, what Sheila said. I just would like to hear your thoughts, especially Ed, before you go, but also Mike. Um, so to what extent do some of the aspects that Sheila discussed come into play in your work, in particular the idea that numbers are parochial and cultural, is that, is, is that something that you're, that, it, that is take, made, made, that you're made aware of regularly or something that is taken account of in the work that you do? Absolutely, and in fact I think um, Sheila's five numbers are statements, uh, they all resonate with me. Uh, numbers are, are powerful. Numbers are political. I, I find that um, I used to work in the National Audit Office, which is the, the UK's um, sort of public sector auditing body, uh, which you might think of is quite often in the public eye and it deals with Parliament a lot. Uh, this role is, by a significant factor, much more political. And I think that's principally because audit is about whereas statistics are about how people make sense of the world. And, of course, it is politicians who create narratives that uh, seek to persuade about uh, both the current state of the world and their preferred future states. So the use of numbers is an intensely uh, a, a political act. I think you're also right to, to ask the question about um, the parochialism of numbers. And one of the things that we uh, think is our role is to uh, challenge, uh, I mean, we wouldn't call it parochialism, we, we would say, um, what are the questions that are being asked by society? And to what extent do those who produce public numbers uh, 
provide insights into those questions. Now, sometimes that can be uh, kind of around technicalities of things like GDP is GDP, uh, measuring the right kind of things in the right kind of way. Sometimes it can be much more basic. So I'll give you a very simple example. Um, the, uh, the Department for Communities and Local Government produces statistics on homelessness, people who are homeless. They also produce statistics on people who sleep rough, which is I, people who are actually sleeping out on a given, and it's a count which is done a couple of times a year. Uh, local authorities go out and they literally count uh, how many people are sleeping rough. They also produce uh, statistics on um, how many people are given relief from the risk of homelessness. It's called prevention and relief. And uh, the Community and Local Government Department used to publish these statistics on separate days, separate uh, timings, with kind of separate definitions and, and so on. And our strong uh, push to them, and actually we took this to the Secretary of State, uh, said you should integrate these because for people to understand the phenomenon of homelessness, to kind of create uh, these, 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 these separate uh, kind of slices of that experience is not helping generate insights that we know there's a, there's a strong civil society demand for. So a big part of my role I see is, 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 is pushing at the edges of that, uh, what I would now define as parochialism. I hadn't had that term in my armory to, to that extent. So I, I, I find those, those, those uh, well, four of those five points really resonant. I didn't quite get performative, but that's my ignorance, I think. Um, I don't know who else can to that. I mean, one of, one of the main things that we were trying to achieve through the, through the noughties was to overcome the problems of trust. And uh, it was fascinating to listen to Sheena talking about the situation in Canada, where, I don't know if you know, but basically, change of government, they decided no longer to run a census. Now, we've moved past that situation, I'd like to think, in this country now through what we've done. The big dichotomy or the, di the, the difficulty is defining what, what, um, what categories numbers fall into. Statistics seems to be now, through the arrangements we've put in place, well partitioned off. Research, on the other hand, is in a terrible place because still ministers in this country can decide whether a research project ever gets published or ever gets seen and so on. And that's the dilemma of the situation, that we don't have a universal mechanism for controlling information in such a way, you know, I'm not a Soviet, but that people, people can trust information. That's really, I think, the problem. So I think there's still a huge dilemma there. We're only partly solving this whole issue. Does that answer your question? Someone wants to come in. Yeah. Thanks. I wanted to actually sort of continue the questioning of Ed, if that's possible. Um, so, um, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, you said, I, I can imagine in your position you are aware of the political, the political side of things. And I'm just wondering how much you think that awareness um, spreads across the ONS. So let me just give you one example. So um, with the data on, um, on, subject, on subjective well-being, which is collected in the annual population survey, you know, great big survey, you've got huge amounts of data on well-being, fantastic. You know, we can start doing things which we could never do before and really under, try and understand the patterns of well-being in the country. But, um, but the data does not have, um, but the data that's published with well-being doesn't include anything about income, household income. Um, and one of the things we know about well-being is that household income is a really important driver. But also, if you care about inequalities, you want to know about how, our, you know, how is well-being spread across the income distribution. You want to know if people who are on lower incomes have much lower well-being than people on higher incomes, and, uh, <coughs> et cetera, and, and whether that gap is getting bigger and smaller. When we've kind of encouraged the ONS to do something about that, We've had no sense that they understand the political, the political point there. That you're, that, I mean, yes, okay, there are data collection problems, blah, blah blah blah, technical issues, but no sense of a recognition that by not doing that, you are actually kind of potentially obfuscating an important, an important bit of uh, um, a, a, a important story or important bit of evidence. A r really interesting example, and I think that um, I wouldn't make this specific to ONS. I think this is a challenge for people who produce public numbers, statisticians, um, in any public sector context. And uh, what they, um, I would really strongly encourage them uh, to do is to strike a balance. And I like all of these things which involve striking balances, they're you know, trade-offs and they're hard. Strike a balance between absolutely attending to the relevance of what they provide and produce into the public domain. Is it relevant to the questions that people want answered? And uh, I think there are multiple examples, not just in the ONS, where there is more work to do on the relevance of what's provided. Uh, 
it's not enough simply to collect some numbers, count them up, and put them out. That's, that's not um, uh, an insightful way of handling this noble responsibility of providing uh, an official statistics uh, kind of lens on things. On the other hand, I think there is a kind of toxicity or a poison of thinking that a job is to be um, an important politics. I think to think with a political lens on um, can be uh, 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 can start to get into that space of untrustworthiness. So I think the way to frame it for those people who are doing this noble act is um, what I am producing relevant, and by relevant is it um, answering questions that people are interested in, and if it's not, how can I make it more relevant? I think that's the way to think about it. That's the way of navigating what I think is, a, is, 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 a, is not a straightforward task for all the right reasons that, that Sheila has explained so cogently. I wanted to ask about productivity and quality. I'm a social economist. I'm interested in the delivery of public services or publicly consumed services, things like health, things like education, things like social care, um, where the word quality is used frequently. There are attempts to measure productivity, and this comes back to the demand for the interest from business, but how good are we at measuring uh, productivity in a whole lot of these areas and how compatible in quite a lot of these areas is the standard enhancement of productivity with the delivery of quality. Of course you could think about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance if anybody wants any uh, footnotes on that I can give them those afterwards. Well I'll kick off as I've got the microphone um, and then hand over to somebody else. I don't think we uh, think about productivity very well. It's a good concept for an economy based on products, and we have an economy based on services, and even the products are much more differentiated than they used to be. We don't, in the statistics, no countries in the statistics do very wide-ranging quality adjustments for products and none for services. And I don't think we even know how to think about it. So you talked about public services, and if you ask how productive is a nurse, you could say um, more productive if they get through 10 times as many patients in a day, or more productive if they get few, fewer patients but care for them much better. And the answer is it depends what the task is. Is the task doing blood tests or is the task caring for a very sick child? And I think um, there's a lot more thinking to be done about what we mean when we talk about productivity. I, I completely agree with that. It, it's it's uh, often struck me as a, as, a, as a very strange debate we're having about the so-called productivity puzzle because it's attaching enormous significance to something which I think is getting increasingly detached from uh, the thing it pur purports to measure. The thing I would add in to what Diane has just said is I'm always very puzzled to see measurements of productivity on international comparisons measuring productivity per hour because for so much of the work that is done, I think the hour is a very odd measurement of the unit of input. Uh, the kind of work that I do, to the extent that anybody would deign to call it productive at all, is not really marginally affected by me spending an extra hour of uh, of my time this evening uh, when I should be voting. You know, the, the hour is not a very meaningful unit of, of, of measurement, and yet people still talk about productivity per hour. I think it's weird, actually. I think there's another problem here, which is that we think we can measure productivity with a one measure, and I think it's, it's like lots of things. Um, you know, development being an obvious one, which it's not that we want, it's not that we want, we think, okay, try and rephrase this. Uh, we could try and measure one thing in lots of different ways, but actually what's underneath a lot of these quite complicated things are that there's lots of different things, lots of different aspects that we need to measure separately, which was trying to get my point about observation. So it's not that we can get one good measure of productivity. I think we need to be thinking like poverty and, and development, this is a complicated thing to get at, and it's not that there's lots of different measures of it, but we can think about lots of different aspects. It's a multidimensional thing. We should have think, think of there being, being several different dimensions which get measured so that we can get a handle on the different dimensions of it. Um, I, I think my question is probably first for Mr. Hughes, but, um, but I imagine many would have uh, thoughts on it. I, I, was wondering in your presentation what the trends in 
the budgets for the ONS had been over time um, because a lot of the people calling for more multiple indices of development have often commented on the, the lack of money available to do the kinds of field surveys um, that one would need to, uh, to measure the household economy or to do time use surveys. Um, and so not only in the UK, but, but, but generally, has there been um, a constituency calling for more funding for, uh, for these more, the, the, the kinds of research you'd need to, to actually cr uh, measure multiple indices, not just GDP? It's, it's probably fair to say that um, statistics has been treated no better and no worse than many other government departments over the last few years in terms of cuts and having to find efficiency savings and changes. And it comes at a time when there's an increased demand all the time for new information and better ways of collecting it. So there's a real tension and conflict there. Um, one of the good things that's happened very recently, and Diane's been directly involved in this, is the, 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 the review that Charlie Bean did recently on economic statistics, where he demonstrated that some of the that some of the things that need to be done, and going back to your point about productivity, Charlie flagged up productivity as an area we need to spend more time on. It did give the opportunity for the Treasury to say, ONS, we'll give you some money to achieve these things, now go away and do it. So that has, that has been a very useful exercise in itself as, as a wake-up call. But uh, at the same time as this is going on, the ONS is still having to go through the 20% cuts each time, and it's a, it's a continual succession of salami slicing. And this is where we've been trying over a period of time to take a much harder view and say, look, you just drop whole, whole statistical series and you don't trim little bits off anymore. The problem is there's a whole plethora of different users out there, and for some of them, that is the most crucial thing in the world. And that's the dilemma of how you match those needs with what you can provide. But the, the situation is not, I wouldn't say, it's not a, a healthy one or a good one. Um, thank you. Um, so Mike's uh, uh, presentation of the takeaway from the survey seemed to draw a distinction between trust in the methods of enumeration and collecting numbers and the methods of combining and presenting numbers. And then many of the following talks talked about the trade-off between aggregating um, or having a multi-varied uh, indicators uh, approach and, and sort of differentiating that. And I wonder to what extent do you really see a distinction um, between those aggregates and then what is presented as quote unquote raw. Um, alongside the move for independence, there's also a move for transparency by making more data sets just available in themselves, right? The move to um, uh, sort of open government in the form of data sets um, has, has been parallel to the independence of the ONS as an operation. Uh, so I'm wondering if we take the sort of Sheila's comment um, seriously about the very act of enumeration itself um, already be a form of cooking. Um, where do you draw the distinction between the aggregate and the raw data? Thank you. Whilst Mike, Mike ponders on the, <laughs> on the answer, um, I mean, I guess I just wanted to flag one thing that I think that, um, I mean, there's, there's politics in, 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 both, in both the selection of the indi individual indicators um, the raw data um, that you that you bother to collect and that you bother to produce in a timely way, etc. Um, and there's probably just as much politics in that as there is in in creating aggregates. Um, so um, I guess we shouldn't. Uh, I, I think we should. We can't all relax and go. Oh, okay, there's no politics if there's no aggregation being done. Um, I think. Yeah, I think that was the point I was trying. Yeah. One of the things I think is really interesting about the sustainable development goals is the way in which um, individual groups uh, of, with particular expertise in a field are, um, in a sense, pushing the agenda for what the indicators might be. So I have a colleague at LSE who's involved in creating one of the indicators. I can't, I'm not actually sure which of the goals it's for, but it's, it's trying to measure legal identity. You know, so there's a group of lawyers getting together to try and figure that out, and it's a, it's a very bottom-up kind of project to create those indicators. So there's a lot of, uh, I think 
a lot of, so lot of sociology needed here to see how this works. But, but as far as I can see, they're all being done in very different ways. Uh, I'll have a go. <laughs> I mean, what I was trying to say when I was put that slide up about trust was that um, I think it, 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 it's, it's the stage when statistics move from the complete product. And there has never been, in my experience, and I was in the GSS for 35 years, never any great political interference with what was collected and the process by which those numbers were put together. The only example I could give recently is where the government has said we shouldn't be spending... 500 million pounds every 10 years on a census, we've got to do it a different way. So that's really the first significant intervention that I've ever seen in this country in terms of ministers and politicians telling statisticians how to do their business. When you then move into the public domain, as Diana illustrated so tellingly in her opening piece, where two different newspapers can present those two statistics in two particular ways, is the dilemma. I mean, you, the trust bit can only go so far in that process. I'm not sure I'm really answering your question particularly well, but um, there's a huge amount involved in all of this in terms of training of journalists as well. And one of the, the huge problems these days is the standards of journalism in, in the new field. I mean, uh, it, it is shocking at times the way things are presented. But politicians will always present the figures the way it suits them to do. I mean. Ed's gone now, and I can say something. But I also work for an organisation, I don't know if some of you have heard of it, called Full Fact, who have been monitoring the referendum and putting out a lot of information. And we flagged up the 350 million a week thing right at the beginning of the process. Um, the authority stepped in and said, you know, this is potentially misleading. Well, it wasn't potentially misleading. It was a downright lie. And unfortunately, I don't think they were hard-edged enough to get that message over quite early. And it just demonstrates how, when something gets currency, that people can just brass neck, turn it out day after day after day. It's been shocking, absolutely shocking. So, it's the, the, the you know, my answer is in very simple terms. You, we can do all we can to produce the best statistics possible, but at the end of the day, you can't control how people will use them. Thank you all for this great panel. Um, Clark Miller uh, from Arizona State University. Um, I had the pleasure 12 years ago of doing a series of interviews in Washington and in London and an in Amsterdam about uh, the GDP and the construction of the GDP. And, and at the time, the British debate was the most interesting of all, and I'm delighted to see that it continues uh, to be a rich uh, and vibrant discussion. Um, I thought. Three things were particularly interesting that perhaps could be pulled out a little bit more sharply uh, from the discussion. Um, one was simply the, the differentiation across the speakers between folks focused on process, that is, how do we measure things and how do we regulate the measurement process to make sure that it's sound, folks focusing on content and folks focusing on politics given that I think in the stories that have followed, these three things can't fundamentally be separated out in the dynamics of how these numbers play out in in day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and, and so I think trying to think about how do we put those three pieces together in the way that we talk about what the problem is, uh, is an important um, uh, sort of observation t for me to come out of this discussion. The second is that it, there was a, a bit of a contradiction, it seemed to me, between, or not contradiction, but tension between a vision of these numbers uh, as essentially constructions. And I'll, I'll take your presentation about the, the five indicators as essentially saying, look, it's all about what we decide we want to measure. And there's no fun, as you said earlier, although you corrected, I think, later around this idea, there's no there there, right? There, we don't know what this thing is that we're actually trying to measure. We've got some defined measure that we're doing. But at the end of the day, it's a construction. And the idea that there's 
that, that there's actually something very real that we're trying to measure, which I actually think is less important from the standpoint of is there a good economic theory of what the economy is than it is from the standpoint that, as Sheila was saying, on the politics of consumption of these numbers, the public actually believes quite deeply in the reality of these numbers. And that's part of why they matter. And so that's a piece of the politics that then plays out quite significantly across a, a, a number of different aspects uh, of these debates. So for example, I've written about the debate about the 2000 presidential election controversy in the United States. You cannot run a democracy if the public doesn't believe that its electoral outcomes, its tallies at the end of the day, don't tell it who won and who lost the election. You actually have to, I mean, everybody has to buy into the notion that this electoral knowledge making institution has created a representation of reality or they don't trust the outcome. And they don't have confidence in their institutions. So there's a level at which that I think is part of the story that Sheila was trying to say about performativity. The last thing I would say is just, I would add a sixth point to Sheila's, and that is that public numbers are really expensive. Um, and that is a big deal because it means that you, the political economy of these numbers is you can't just produce whatever number you want you're very much stuck with the ones that the government has decided to invest heavily in. And the, the, the economics, if you will, of these debates has become very, very serious uh, in terms of, uh, of who's allowed to participate in the manufacturing of these numbers that really actually do matter. And so how the government defines these numbers does matter because they're the one, they're one of the agencies that's doing uh, that, that collection. There are now other entities that are doing it. But this notion that we're awash in data is just generally not true. Uh, we're, we're awash in very specific kinds of data that certain institutions have decided to spend an enormous amount of money collecting. Uh, and, if, and if you haven't collected what you actually want, and people who were doing sustainability indicators in the 1990s ran into this problem all the time, if you don't, aren't actually collecting data on what you want, you're just stuck. You can't go there, right? Because to put a new, date, a new indicator into the, into the mix and actually go collect that data is a hugely costly enterprise and local uh, governments and, and NGOs and, and other kinds of, of entities that might want to play in this game simply can't do that. They don't have the wherewithal, the economic wherewithal, uh, to make that shift in what the number set looks like. So we've run, we've run against time, but I'm going to give a chance to everyone to say, have a last word or, or respond to uh, this very rich comment. I mean, I, I accept, accept totally your, your point about the cost of official data. And this is why I think the whole dynamics of the new situation with big data and much more powerful digital techniques for analyzing data may be useful. I, I'm slightly cynical about how, how valuable they will be because at the end of the day, your point is unless you're specifically directing your collection and your expenditure at the specific issue that you want to know, you're never going to get the answer to it. It doesn't matter how much you analyze around the edges on it. So I would agree with you entirely. Um, but it's the problem that we, we face in this country now. We don't have a population register, but we've got to find a way of having a much more of cheap, a, a more, a more cost-effective way of enumerating the population and its characteristics than we do at the moment. And so it is, it is a huge, huge issue. Um, on the cost, um, if the official statistics are not there and we have a knowledge-based economy in which information is a raw material, private sector agents are going to start producing the data. I think it's interesting to think about someone like Ed um, developing a kite mark for telling us which sets of private sector data are statistically robust and can be trusted. But at any rate, we have to get more efficient about producing statistics for the, for the reasons of the co these cost pressures. 
Um, on one of your other points, there is this sort of um, reflexivity that you point to. I mean, of course, there's some there, there. People have enough food to eat or they don't. Um, but the way people think about what's there changes significantly over time. And the way people thought about it during the era of the physiocrats was completely different from the way we, th we think about it now. Being an economist, I think about it in game theoretic terms. There are multiple equilibria. And there is some, there is some framework of rules that sets the focal point, And that changes over time. Yeah, I guess I want to say there's a big difference between data and measurements. And uh, what we're looking, we may be awash in data, but not necessarily awash in good measurements. And that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I probably am going to be shot down here, but I, I guess I have positive, pos positivist tendencies. And I, would, I do think that in a way, um, there, you, there is a there in terms of how people's lives are going. But I think there is a such thing as how someone's life is going. And, and that, that, that can be in some way assessed. It's not easy. Um, you know, questions about how you do it, but I think that, and, and we have always advocated something a bit more subjective. Um, and even if someone thinks that they're, even if someone says they're happy and they shouldn't be because they're whatever, such and such, if they think they're happy, they are happy, and I think there is something real there. Um, but I think the real challenge is how do you aggregate multiple people, um, and, and that's where things become very political and, and, very, and, and, ve and very difficult. Um, and just in terms of sort of like the three things you mentioned, process, content, and politics. Um, so we, we, um, we did a project called Brainpool, um, which was, so it's a great, um, it's a strange name, Brainpool. It's an acronym, and you have to do acronyms if you do EU projects. Um, and it's bringing alternative indicators into policy. And we tried to look at sort of what are the, so we tried to identify some of the sort of success, success factors in terms of alternative indicator initiatives. Um, so one of them was about process, so very much about stakeholders in particular, sort of like being engaged in the process. Um, there, was, there was one also which was very much about the politics, about the fact that an indicator isn't going to be successful if, um, or if it doesn't have some kind of political champion that says, oh yes, this indicator shows that what I think already um, is good. Um, and actually the content was actually less, less important almost in a way in terms of what we, what we identified as success factors, yes, quality and all that sort of thing, but it didn't actually play such a big role in people's um, sense, sense of what was successful. Um. Just very quickly, I, we may not be awash in data, partly because of the contrast that Mary draws between data and measurement, uh, but there's no question that the ability to collect numbers on huge scales has increased, and there are lots more players around who are collecting those kinds of numbers, and not for nothing do we now have a term data oligarch to refer to people other than the state who are producing and collecting lots and lots of big numbers. So maybe we're not awash in data, but we are awash in data claims. And I think that that, you know, in a day when we're in the middle of an election where uh, public ability to convince people about public numbers obviously has not resulted in polling bumps of the sort that one might have expected, it leads us back into the question, the fundamental questions of politics. I mean, you know, questions of trust that have already been raised, but questions about, you know, fund deeper underlying matters of the social contract. You know, who do we uh, entrust, not just trust, with taking responsibility for determining which things are going to be important to keep track of via numbers, and uh, in a world in which the capacity to produce numbers is now far more distributed and um, dangerously so to some extent, you know, where do we come home at the end of the day to say, yes, Sam is the person to whom I will give my well-being and his number is the one I will go on. behind you and please uh, go ahead and